You are important. You belong. You have a destiny and a future. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a spiritual family of believers from all over the world where you can discover your purpose and grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. You will hear teachings by Dr. Peter Youngren, Pastor Nathan Thurber, and others. You will participate in worship, prayer, and taking the Lord's communion every week. You will enjoy video testimonies and interviews from around the world. No matter where you live, your prayer request will be included in every service. This will truly be an international online church. Wherever you live, from Southeast Asia to Europe, North and South America, Africa, and Australia, this can be your spiritual home. All over the world, I meet people who ask me if there's a way that they can participate in the services from the Toronto Celebration Church. Well, we're offering something much more than just a streaming service. This is a full-fledged online church for you. The World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you can find a spiritual family, a place of belonging, and where you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Set your calendar for 10.30 a.m. New York time. That's 4.30 p.m. Central European time and 10.30 p.m. for most countries in Southeast Asia. Heaven will include people of every culture, nationality, and ethnicity, and this will be a foretaste of heaven. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you belong, where you will be nurtured, and where you can find your destiny. Toronto Celebration Church is a story of God's love drawing people from different backgrounds, cultures, even religions to be empowered to live their maximum life and to serve the community and the world. When I came here, I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand, I had a walker. But when I came to TICC, I was totally and completely miraculously healed. TICC is... Uh family for us, for me and my husband. Uh, one of the best things that I really like about TICC is definitely the youth ministry or the youth program. And I'm truly blessed here uh, by the simple message of God's unconditional love, grace and mercy. I found the church I've always dreamed of. A church is not about building. It is about people. People from every part of society, young and old. People from Asia, Europe, the islands of the sea, Africa and across the Americas, together creating a better society, because to personally know God's love is the key to the ultimate life, and in a constant pursuit to find ways to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to Toronto and Canada, we believe that the best is yet to come. 
Welcome to Celebration Church Online. Happy and blessed new year. We are so glad you have joined with us today. Today is the first Sunday of 2022. We trust you had a very blessed holiday and Christmas season. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing prayer at TICC.ca. If you are new to Celebration Church, we'd love to send you a free gift to say thank you. If you live in Toronto, we will mail you a free hardcover book written by Pastor Peter, The Faith That Works. Also, I will be sharing an amazing report of what God is doing through Celebration Church and God setting someone in our church free from occultic practices. We have a lot planned for you today, so let's get ready to worship. Let's go there right now. You are the awesome
Well, my message today is move forward with God's plan. Many people want to know, what's God's will? How do I move forward with, with life? Do you know that God does have a plan? God has a will for your life, and it's a good one. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan. God has a good plan, and He has a future for you. That means that you're not just a float in the universe of life. You're not a piece of garbage uh, uh, with no value. You're not a nobody in the middle of billions of people. No, you're a somebody, and God has a plan for your life. God cares for you. And not only does God have a plan for your life, a will for your life, God wants you to know His plan. God wants you to know His will for your life. In fact, the book of Ephesians, Paul says, Ephesians 5 and 17, he says, don't be unwise. In fact, we're being exhorted here. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, we're being exhorted, not just that God has a will, but to know his will. God wants us to know. And furthermore, he so wants us to know that in John chapter 16, Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you that He will guide you. We've been given the Holy Spirit to guide us, to guide us into God's plan, to guide us into His will. God wants us to know His plans, His purposes, and His wills. Today we're talking about how to know, how to do His good good plans, His good will for, for our lives. And I propose that it is to our benefit to know and to do God's will for our lives. It's to our benefit. I heard a story that illustrates this benefit to us, to follow God's plan, follow God's will for our lives. I heard a story of two men. They grew up together, and one had become a great success financially. The other, he, didn't, he, he made some wrong, bad choices and ended up not much, not much finances, not so well. So the, friend, the rich friend decided he wanted to be a blessing to the poorer friend, and so he decided I, he, he, he hired the poor, poorer friend, poor individual, to build him a house. He was a home builder. And so he gave him a certain sum of money, and he said, here's the money. I don't, I'm not going to come and inspect it. You just build the house, and when you're done, I'll, I, 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 just let me know. I, I, I'm not going to pay any attention. You just do it. Put in the best, and, and I'll pay for it. Well, that, that poor friend, he wasn't overly scrupulous. He, he wasn't full of integrity. And so he began to build the house, but he began to cut corners. Yes, he thought, after all, no, he's not the, the rich friend. He's not coming to inspect any house. I'm going to cut corners, put in substandard materials, maybe some bad wiring, some poor lumber. And he began to cut corners, thinking that this was his opportunity to make some money, skimming off the top. Well, finally the, the house was done, and he, he, the poor friend brought the keys to his rich friend and said, I'm done building. Here, here you are. Here's your house. He gave him the keys. Well, the rich friend took the keys, looked at them for a minute, and, and then he turned around and passed the keys back to that poor friend and said, well, I just wanted to be a blessing to you. These, this house was actually for you. The house that you built, you get to live in it now. And he passed him back the keys. Well, you, you, you get the point of the story. That, that man who had cut corners, made a substandard house, well, now he had to live in it. He had, you know, so he would have been better off. And, you know, in the same way, you know, when it comes to God's plans and purposes and will, God's not mad. God's not, you know, going to punish if you say, I, I, I'm not moving forward with God's plan and God's will for my life. I'm not going to obey. God's not punishing. But the, but the, the reality is, it, it, we're the ones who have to live in the lives that we create, the lives that we, that we, that we I- inhabit on this earth. And so God, God, Jesus came that we'd have an abundant life, and his plans and purposes are for our, our, our good. He says, I, I, I have good plans for you, prosperity and a future. So it's to our benefit to follow his will, his plans, his purposes for, for our lives. Maybe, but maybe you're watching today, you said, but Nathan, I'm broken, I'm in a mess. I'm, I think I'm so far past following God's plans and God's will for my life. I, 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 I'm, I'm in such a mess. Well, can I tell you, God's a God of grace. He can, and, and in that grace, he'll fix, He can fix any mess you're in. He may not, He can't change the past. That's happened, but He can fix your future. He can reveal His plans, and he can keep move, you can keep moving forward with Him into a good future. I wish we were together. I'd, say, I'd ask you to say, say a big amen, but, but just know that. No matter where you're at, God has a good plan for your life. And so today, as we look at God's, uh, looking at moving forward with God's plan, we're going, we'll look at four attributes, four attributes of knowing and doing God's good plan for our lives. And I call these attributes because 
Sometimes we're looking for a checklist. Oh, I want a checklist of how I, how I can know God's will for my life. And I'll just go through this list of checks and, uh, and steps, and, and then I'll know. No, you know what? I, I call these attributes. It's, it's more like a framework. You know, when you're building a house, you build a frame, and then you live inside the house. You know, God, there's a certain framework how we can know God's will. There's a certain framework in which we can know God's plans for our lives. And within that framework, we're, we live with a certain freedom. I mean, you have a personality and you have desires and interests. Uh, you're not a robot. And so, but there is a certain framework in which we can know God's plans, God's purposes for our lives. And then within that, we're free to live, free to be ourselves. God gave you a unique personality, a unique desires. And within that framework, we're free to be ourselves and to live a, a, a prosperous, flourishing life in connection with God. And so this is a great reality. So first attribute is of knowing God's purposes, God's plan for our life is agreement, agreement with Scripture. God's plans and purposes will always be in agreement with Scriptures. And I put on the screen there, just to be clear, agreement with New Covenant Scriptures. You know, there's a lot of Old Testament Scriptures that, that don't relate to us today. There's Scriptures about different fabrics you can't wear and different foods you can't eat and, you know, even, even archaic rules about, you know, killing, about, you know, do something wrong, you can kill somebody. I mean, these, these are not, when I talk about agreement with Scriptures, I'm talking about, if you don't understand what I mean by new, agreement with New Covenant, in scriptures, keep listening here at Celebration Church, and we'll, under, we'll, we'll teach you what that means. But, but New Covenant Scriptures, and in the New Covenant, as revealed through Jesus Christ, there are many things that the Scriptures teach us about God's will, His plan for our life, that gives us a foundation to understand how to move forward with God. Uh, at its very basic, salvation. The Scripture says that God's not willing that any be saved. That's God's will for your life. The Scriptures teach us that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being filled and endued with power from on high, that is part of God's plan, God's purpose for every person, God, every believer. You watching today, you don't have to, is that God's plan for my life? No, that's part of His plan, His purpose for your life. Part of God's plan and purpose for your life is deliverance, freedom from anything, any bondage or a, a, a addiction. That's God's plan for you, freedom, deliverance. Jesus came in Luke chapter 4. He said, I've been anointed by the Spirit to set the captive free. To set the captive, you don't have to pray and fast. Does God want me to be free? He wants you to be free. That's part of His plan. The Scripture reveals this. Galatians chapter 3, God tells us he, 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 God wants you blessed. He doesn't want you cursed. Poverty is a curse. God wants you blessed. Galatians chapter 3. You don't have to think, well, is poverty God's plan for my life? No, that's not God's plan. Poverty is not a blessing from God. It's a curse. God, God wants you blessed. Healing. The scriptures are very clear that God is healer. Jesus, by his stripes, you've been healed. And on and on and on. 3 John 2. Beloved, I desire above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. This is God's will. You don't have to wonder and be in the dark. And does God want me to be healed? No, God wants you healed. The scripture, New Covenant Scriptures tell us that God wants you part of a spiritual family. Every person part of a spiritual family. Hebrews says, don't neglect the assembling of your selves together. So these are not things we have to wonder about and search. This. I mean, it's good to search the Scriptures, but these are self-evident realities, and it gives us a foundation. You don't have to pray and fast. Is it God's will for me to be healed? No, God wants us to be well, and this gives a foundation. So number one, His plans and purposes are always in agreement with the scripture. Number two, attri second attribute of knowing God's plans and purposes for our lives is peace. Peace. God's plans will always be led, always lead us by peace. Peace should be our guiding force that leads us forward into God's plans. Colossians chapter 3. It says in verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. I, never, I, know, I love what another translation says. It says the peace that Christ gives is to guide you. The peace that he gives is to guide you in the decisions that you make, to guide us. Peace, peace is to guide us. In other words, making a decision, is there peace in my heart? If there's no peace, it's a good, it's a good uh, opportunity to pause for a moment. And wonder, is there, is there something wrong in the decision that I'm making? Maybe I should hold back. Maybe I should move forward. If I'm not moving forward, I have no, no peace. Peace is to guide us. God's peace is to guide us. In other words, if there's turmoil and agi agitation, something needs, some, there's something needs to be corrected. And so peace is to guide us moving forward. Now, and yet if we take account of our lives, and, 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 I, and I think we're all a work in progress in this area, but, but, but how often is it that negative emotions guide our decision making? 
Negative emotions guide our decision making. In other words, I go through a bad season. And bad seasons come in all areas of life. It could be in, in finance. It, maybe it's with your children. A bad season in your marriage. A bad season at work. A bad season in, in your health. You go through a bad season and we're tempted to bail. You know what I mean by bail? Quit. Bail on the dream that we had in our heart. Bail on that marriage. Bail, bail on the job. Bail on the business. We're tempted to bail. You go through a bad season and we're, we're tempted to, to jump. You know, oftentimes that, 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 those decisions aren't led by peace. They're led by other emotions. Anger or, or fear or anxiety or jealousy or envy. That, that, that's not peace. That's, the, that's quite the contrary of peace. And, and so we, we need to be, I recognize we, sh, we are to be led by peace. Peace is to, to guide us. Many times these decisions we make outside of peace are very short-sighted and self-sabotaging. Again, it's not that God's angry. If anything, he's sad. He's, his heart is broken because he, see how, he sees how it sabotages us. It's self-sabotaging behavior. You know, it's many times, many, in some ways, life is like an airplane. Once you get into something, you get into something. Uh, uh, you know, when you're on an airplane, let's take an airplane for a moment. When you're on an airplane and you hit turbulence, well, that's not the time to run to the uh, you know, the, the cockpit, it's, I don't know if that's the right term, you know, run to the pilot and start asking him questions, run around the, you know, when you hit turbulence, what do they tell you to do? Sit down, put your seatbelt on. I can recall a time when I, I was flying from South uh, Khartoum, uh, Sudan, uh, uh, down to uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, uh, and we, had, we left at 2 a.m. in the morning out of Khartoum, uh, and so it was pitch black, and we were flying over the South Sudan, it's mostly desert, we were flying over that, and then suddenly, they came on the uh, radio and, and said, we've been hit. They didn't say what. I found out later, I, once we landed, that we had been hit. I did, actually, they don't know what we were hit. But something hit the front windshield and cracked the front windshield of that 737 flying over the South Sudan desert. Well, they said, we've been hit. We have to do an emergency landing. I, I mean, that wasn't turbulence, but in my heart, it was turbulence. And so here we are. Uh, we have to do an emergency landing in the South Sudan desert. Well, you know. All I could envision was that plane coming down into some desert, you know, into some sand, massive sand dune and exploding into a ball of flames. I mean, this, this was literally what I was feeling at that, in those moments. But I can tell you, in those, also in those moments, there wasn't a soul moving around the airplane. Not a soul. In fact, not only did they tell us to put our seatbelts on, we had our heads between our knees for a crash landing. It wasn't very pleasant in my heart at the moment. Having said that, my point was, when there's a difficulty on an airplane, you don't run around, you buckle in, and you stay put. You stay put. In many ways, that's a good lesson for life. You know, you're in the middle of something, in the middle of a course at school. You're in the middle of a, you know, some business deal. Don't quit on it. Don't, we're not created to be quitters. You know, my son, Leo, he's four years old, so I can share stories. Once he's older, I can't share stories about him, but I can for now. He's four. He doesn't even know I'm sharing them. But anyhow, you know, he, he loves a lot of things. For example, he loves ice skating. But there's certain things he doesn't like, like all of us, and he doesn't like swimming. He's four years old, doesn't like swimming. He's in swimming lessons, and, and he, he really doesn't like them, not at all. But, you know, my wife and I have decided, not out of, and, you know, this isn't, we're not trying to punish him, but, but we said, you know what, we're not, he's not quitting. He's going to finish those lessons. He may not be the next Michael Phelps. He may not even ever like swimming, or maybe he will. Who knows? But he's not quitting. Not quitting these lessons. He can go. He, he may not even pass the lesson, but he's not quitting. Because you know what? Once we start quitting on things, it gets easier to quit the next time, and then easy to quit the next time. We're not quitters. God didn't create us to be quitters. Paul, the Apostle Paul, in his pursuit of the Great Commission, of fulfilling the Great Commission, he said, I fight the fight. I, I, I fight. In other words, there needs to be a fight in us. A, a dis he said, I discipline myself. You know, life's not a, life, we're never promised that life would always be easy. There's going to be whatever dream you get involved with, there's going to be opposition. Opposition. People are going to talk about you. There's going to be financial opposition. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. So we have to have this made-up mind. I'm not a quitter. I, I'm not a quitter. And when the going gets tough, I'm sitting in my seat and I'm buck buckling up. Of course, you know, you say, but Nathan, isn't there times when I should get out of something? Of course, but peace should lead you. You know, when you run, let's take the airplane example. When I, if I was to run around that airplane while we were crash landing, that wasn't peace leading me. That was anxiety and fear and panic. Imagine if I went there and pulled open that, by the way, I lived. We didn't end up crash landing. We ended up going, anyhow, it's a long story, but I lived. But, but, but if, imagine if I went to the emergency exit and pulled that and jumped out. I mean, how crazy would that? But that's what we do. We're in the middle of some, some deal. We're in the middle of some, some lessons, middle of some schooling, and we bail because the going gets tough. Don't bail. 
Don't bail. Maybe you're in the middle of something today. You're not a quitter. You are not a quitter. You're created by God to keep moving forward. Amen? So number one, number two, I should say, number second attribute, be led by peace. Third attribute. We've got to keep moving here. Counsel. The third way, we, the third attribute, third framework, I could say, for knowing God's plans, purposes, and will for our life is it counsel, counsel. Proverbs chapter 19 says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Listen to advice, accept instruction that you may gain wisdom uh, in the future. We need counsel. We need advice from others when it comes to plans, purposes, uh, and God's will for our lives. Now, when I talk about counsel, I, there's two ditches one can get into. I'm not talking about taking a poll on Facebook when you're trying to make a decision. Should I move here? Should, should I move to Belgium? And you put that on Facebook, and you're trying to get a poll from all your Facebook, 200 Facebook friends. Well, if you have 200 Facebook friends and you put out a poll, you're probably going to get about 500 different ideas, 500 different ideas, and you'll go nuts. You'll never make a decision. I'm not talking about asking every Tom, Dick, and Harry. That's insanity. That's crazy. You're going to lose your mind if you do that. I, 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 but let's make it more practical. I'm not talking about telling every person you know. I, 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 you know, you need some key people in your life that you can trust, that are, that are going to give good counsel. On the other ditch is that, oh, I'm so, you know, I'm an island to myself. I don't need anybody. You know, I'm married, but I, and I wake up in the morning, and without even consulting my wife, without ask, talking to anybody else, we're moving to Belgium. Well, that's another bit of, that's another ditch. That's, that's crazy, too. We need counsel. We need advice. And so what does is, what is good counsel look like? Well, good counsel is godly counsel that agrees with the Scriptures, that is also confirmed by peace in your heart, and, and godly counsel will do that, but, but it also speaks of experience. You know, good counsel is a counsel that has experience. You know, in other words, if, you need, uh, if you're, you're doing in a business dealing, well, well good counsel is, comes from somebody who has experience in business. You know, if somebody has no experience in finance or business, don't go to them for advice in finance or business. They don't know anything about it. They might be good, godly people, but they don't have financial sense. You've got to go with someone who has experience, or if it's parenting, or if it's in ministry work. They, you know, find someone who has experience in that area. I think in the Scriptures, you know, King Solomon had a son, Rehoboam, and he became king. And it says in First King, we'll go there in a second, but it says that, you know, he didn't seek the right counsel. He went to counsel that had no experience, and he ended up getting in trouble. In fact, look at the verse, 1 First Kings, First Kings 12. Verse 8, but he, Rehoboam, he ignored the advice of the elders. In other words, those who had experience. He ignored it, which they had given to him and consulted with young men. In other words, inexperienced people who had grown up with him and, and served him. As a result, he brought a lot of trouble on himself. The kingdom split apart because he didn't listen to people who had experience. People who had experience. Um, secondly, good counsel looks like counsel that doesn't always agree with you. <laughs> Does, you know, good counsel has to disagree with you at t from time to time. Has to. You know, I, I've discovered that you, you, know, you can find, th even counseling, professional counselors that you pay money for, you, if you look hard enough, you'll find a counselor that agrees with you. you. You'll find a friend who agrees with you. You can find someone to agree with you. But be very careful. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 27, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. In other words, Friends are willing to speak truth to us even if it's not what we want to hear. We need counsel in our lives that do that or else we'll end up shipwrecking our lives, getting ourselves into trouble. Now, God, can you say, I'm already in that mess, Nathan. God can rescue you. But you know, God loves us so much, he'd rather prevent that from happening if possible. We need people who are willing to speak truth to us that we don't, maybe that doesn't agree with what you're hoping to. You know, some people are so helping on a certain idea They'll just find someone to agree with them and say, aha, someone's agreed with me. You know, I've, I've worked here now 21 years, I think almost 22 years for Pastor Peter now. So I've been here quite a while. And I know I look young, but I've been here quite a while now, 22 years. Anyhow, over that time, I, I've seen uh, ministers, young, young ministers, and when I say young, I'd say inexperienced. Some old, some, some young in age, but inexperienced ministers come and uh, either seek advice from Pastor Peter, uh, wanting his mentorship, wanting his guidance. And yet, sadly, so many times I've seen how that when the advice or the mentorship, whatever they, they got from him wasn't what they wanted to hear, they ran. They ran. They didn't, they, you know, because, you know, he'd been, he's been at it over 40 years now. He's been there, done that. He has a lot of experience. 
And so when he sees, he sees pitfalls in the future that that person had never, wouldn't think of because he's been there, he's done that. And yet, sadly, some, many times when he shares that advice, someone doesn't want to hear it, they run. They, they look for somebody who will agree with them. And it may be somebody, it could be a relative, it could be a spouse, it could be some other inexperienced minister, but someone who agrees with them, and that's what they do. It's very sad. And then years later, you never hear from them again. You know, so, so we have to be very careful. We need to be open ourselves to counsel that doesn't agree with us because that'll keep us on the straight and narrow. That'll keep us moving forward in God's plans and purposes. That'll keep us safe. Amen? Are, are we together on that? So third attribute is counsel. We need counsel. Not everybody, but we need some good experienced counsel. And then fourth, fourth, fourth attribute is timing. How to know God's plan. How to move forward with God's plan for our life. God's plan is found in timing. Timing is important. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord, and in all your ways submit to Him. I made that word submit, uh, all caps, all caps. You know, submit, it, means of, it speaks of a surrender. It speaks of a willingness to walk away. You know, sometimes, and I'm not talking about walking away from a marriage or walking away from, because I obviously in a, in a previous point, in peace, the peace point, I, you know, I, I highlighted don't bail, don't quit, you know. But at the same time, what I'm talking about here is, you know, those things we get in our heart. I, I have this dream and I want it so bad. And the dream might be from God, by the way. That's not a bad thing. We need dreams in our hearts. We need goals. We need aspirations. But at the same time, those dreams, those aspirations, it's, they can potentially become our, our God, right? become an idol in our lives, become greater than God to us. In other words, I, I'm pursuing that business deal, I'm pursuing that ministry pursuit, pursuit, and it becomes even bigger than God. You see, God wants us to seek Him first, because in that there's safety. It's not that He doesn't want us to have those dreams, He does. He put them in our hearts, but our safety is in when He is first place in our hearts. And so there needs to be a willingness always, as great as the dream is, and as, far, as hard as I pursue it, a willingness to step away should He call, should He ask us to, should He call us to do this, should there be, should we need to, a willing, you know, when you live with that willingness in your heart, it's a free thing, it's a freeing thing. You're not bound by anxiety and fear that, oh, I have to make this happen. You know, no, I'm in God's hands. He's helping me make this happen. There's an inner surrender. I'm, a willing, to, I'm willing to walk away should he choose to do that. And it, it, it makes us very open to direction, open to his timing, because timing is important. You know, you can have a good plan, but at the wrong time, even God's plan, but at the wrong time, it can end up with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of problems. I heard about a a 19-year-old, he's much older now. In fact, he's a successful minister of the gospel. But when, many years ago, when he was 19, you know, he had it in his heart to become a minister. And that was a good plan. for God. That was a God plan. He's a minister of the gospel today. But at 19, he had, it in, he had this dream in his heart. So he thought, I'm going to make it happen. And so at 19, he'd just gotten married. His wife was 18. He, he decided he was going to sell everything. He had a job, but he decided he was going to quit his job and sell everything and move to another place, move for, you know, to another uh, state uh, quite far away, and he was going to work for a certain church that he had it on his heart to work for. So he did it. He did it. He, he, sold, he quit his job, sold everything, took his wife, didn't even ask his wife, just said, we're moving, went to this other place, so he came to the church and said, I'm, I'm ready to work. Well, they said, well, we're not actually looking to hire anybody. We're not in a position to hire anybody. We appreciate it, appreciate it, but we're not in a position. It's not the right time. Well, you know, he said this nearly devastated him. It nearly ruined his marriage. It took him years to recover. Now, thank God he recovered. Thank God God's grace picked him up and he recovered. And today he's a great minister of the gospel. But he brought a lot of pain on his life for a number of years because he missed timing. He was, you know, sometimes we call impulsive immaturity. We call it faith. Well, impulsive immaturity isn't necessarily faith if we just listen to timing. Take good counsel. You know, if he had consulted some good counsel, uh, he didn't know Pastor Peter at the time, but for example, Pastor Peter, 40 plus years of ministry, if he had just consulted someone with some experience, they probably would say, you know what, that's a good thing you have on your heart, but just there's some things you should do first. Wait for the timing, you know, but he didn't. Impulsive immaturity, that's not faith. That's not faith. You know, it needs to line up with counsel. It needs to line up with peace. It needs to line up with agreement with Scripture. All of these things need to come together. Yeah, so, and, and timing. You know, when it comes to God's plans for our lives, He doesn't force us. You know, if we want something bad enough, He'll say, okay, go ahead and get it. Go ahead and get it. He's not going to force and stop you. I mean, I think of the, the Hebrew people. They wanted a king so badly. It wasn't His best for them, but, but they wanted it. So He said, okay, go ahead and get your king. Go ahead and get your You know, that's the same with us. We want it so bad. It may not always be good for us. It may not be His best, but He's not going to just force it and stop you. 
you know, uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 talks about, in, in the context of the scriptures of that entire passage, which I won't read now for sake of time, but it's talking about God's plans, purposes for our lives. And Jeremiah chapter 2, it's talking about a person, it, connects, it, it uses a connection of a person who just so badly wants something. It, it links them to, in verse 24, a wild donkey accustomed to the wilderness, sniffing at the wind in her passion, who can turn her away in, in her mating season. In other words, like an animal who, you know, in mating season, there's nothing stopping an animal in mating season. It's just that's what, that's what they're going to get. You know, in the same way, sometimes we get these ideas in our heads that we're just come hell or high, we're going to make it happen. You know, nothing's going to stop us. Not even God himself is going to stop us. You know, we'll find anybody, we'll find a counsel who, who a friend, a counsel who agrees with us. We'll, you know, what, we'll bypass any checks of peace in our heart. We're just going to make it happen. You know, that ends up in some problems from time to time. Ends up in problems from time to time. Other people, you know, when it comes to these things, they, you know, they, they use Gideon as an example. And they use Gideon's, you know, he put out fleece and said, you know, God, if it's your will, if it's just, this is your plan for me, I, let it be wet in the morning. Or the other time, let it be dry. You know, he, he used fleece and uh, but by the way, Gideon's example was not an example of faith. It was an example of doubt. God had already told him his plan. Uh, Gideon was doubtful. Gideon was doubtful. So Gideon's example isn't the best for us to begin with. Secondly, Gideon didn't have the Holy Spirit. We do. We have the Holy Spirit who guides us, who lives in us. So that's another aspect. And then thirdly, you know, many people use this example of Gideon. They call it fleecing, but they use it to manipulate God to manipulate God for his plans for their lives. You know, for example, let's say, you, you know, you, you, is this God, God, is it your will for me to marry so-and-so? You say, well, God, if, it's, if, if I see so-and-so at the bus stop after church, then I know it's your will for me to marry them. If I see so-and-so at the bus stop after church, then I know it's your will for me to marry Well, you know, you already knew that so-and-so would be at the bus stop after church because they're always at the bus stop after church. So you just kind of manipulated the whole thing and set it up for God so, so that you could say, now, oh, see, that's God's plan for my life. No, don't manipulate God. Live free. Use all these attributes. Use the framework. Get, have godly counsel. Use peace. Don't manipulate. And by the way, we don't have to manipulate God. Some people are so bound up, and I'm almost done here preaching, but I, some people are so bound up thinking that, you know what, it's like you're walking a tightrope. If, if I make one wrong step, I'm going to miss God's plan for my life. If I, if I make one wrong step, I'm going to miss His will for, your, for my life. God's plans and purposes are not a tightrope for you to walk. And then if you displease God, you're going to fall and never get back. That's not how He works. The Scripture says, first of all, if the righteous fall seven times, they keep getting back up. And as I said at the beginning, I don't care how broken down, messed up your past is, God can reveal a good future for you today. Amen? And, and furthermore, last verse, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians 2 and 10. It tells us that our future, His plans, He created it all beforehand. We're not, it's not something we're creating, producing. Look at this, Ephesians 2 10. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, He prepared beforehand your future. You know, it's not something we have to prove to God, have to, have to earn, have to, you know, our part is to rest in Christ, recognizing that His plan is a gift to us. God's plan is a gift to us. Our part is to receive it. He gives us all these attributes, agreement with scriptures, being led by peace, good godly counsel, and His timing, so that we might receive that gift. But never think for a moment that through some merit of yourself, you're going to earn a better future. No, God's future and plan, it was, it's His gift to us, created before time. He gives us these attributes so that we might receive. These help us to receive that which He has already given to us, and it's all freely by grace. You know, Jesus said, and I'm, I, know, I know I already said this, I'm almost done, we got so many great things coming. Coming up in today's service, by the way, Pastor Peter will be with us, Holy Communion, great ministry reports. But, you know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 talked about the, he said, woe unto you. And he gave some, four different woes, but he taught, he said, woe unto you. And it basically, woe to you if you live according to the flesh. Woe to you if you don't live in God's plans. Now, when Jesus said woe, he wasn't putting a curse. He wasn't putting a curse on people. No, when he said woe, you know, when you say woe is me, you're not saying I curse myself. Oh, woe is me. You're not cursing yourself. What are you doing? You're having a pity party. When you say, oh, woe is me, it's a bit of a... So when Jesus said, woe, woe unto you if you, you know, make other things than God your priority, he's not saying, I curse you, I hate you. He's saying, I feel sorry for you. Why? Because when we place other things in priority to God, we... we we're not living the abundant life. We're not living, we don't, we don't connect with the true purposes and, and deep things of God. God, true fulfillment, true abundant life is found in relation with God when He is 
first priority. The scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. God has a good plan for your life. Jeremiah, I read that at the beginning. He has a plan for a future, a prosperity, blessing, and hope. He has a good future for you. I hope these things have blessed you today. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you today that you do have a plan, that we can move forward with you. And Father, I thank you that you've given us these attributes, agreement with Scripture, counsel, peace, timing, so that we might receive and walk in that which you've prepared for us before the beginning of time. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for freedom coming to individuals who thought they were walking a tightrope, that if they missed it, you, they'd never get back in your will again. No, Father, I thank you that we are safe and secure. Father, I thank you that you're remaking people's futures. Maybe they thought they, they've messed up and, and, and never could get back in it. But Father, I thank you that you're breathing hope into them today. In Jesus' name, amen. I spend my privilege to pray with you. Now, before I pass it over to Pastor Peter, I want to say one more thing. Maybe you're watching today and you say, I don't know peace. I don't have peace with God. You talk about peace as one of the, the, the attributes, peace. Well, I, don't, I don't have peace with God. I feel there's an, something between us. You know, the scripture says that, we, that Jesus came that we, might have, that we might, first of all, know that God is at peace towards us. And when we believe on him, we receive that peace in our heart. Jesus, the prince of peace. The scripture says that we are to believe on Jesus, that he came, he died, he was buried, he rose again alive today, and he has forgiven you. Would you receive his forgiveness today? Would you receive his love? It would be my privilege to include you when I pray. Let's just pray right now. Would you pray with me? Uh, say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying, taking my place. Thank you for taking my sin, but I believe you're alive today. Thank you for forgiving me. And Right now, I declare you're my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. Make all things new in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, it's been my privilege to pray with you. You can see on the screen some information that I'd be my privilege to send to you, whether a digital copy or by physical copy here in Toronto. You can request that. be honored to send that to you as well. Plus, whether you prayed this today to receive Christ as your Savior or you have in the past, but you've never been water baptized, Sunday, January the 16th, here in Toronto, we'd be honored to water baptize you. It's a public, powerful public declaration of new life in Christ. It's a point of contact with freedom in Christ Jesus. Over the last several months, we've had the privilege of water baptizing over 60 people here at Celebration Church. And in January, we'd love to baptize you as well in water. Well, in a moment, Megan's going to be with us to share a ministry report of a powerful uh, deliverance, an individual in our church set free from occultic practices, powerful uh, story. Uh, so you're not going to want to miss that. Of course, the Holy Communion as well. Get ready to receive in your own uh, life. First, we're going to take a moment to receive our tithes and offerings. This is our first offering uh, of the new year, 2022, and it's a beautiful time to sow our first fruit offerings to set the tone for the rest of the year. I know my wife and I, we sit down and make a let me make a plan, a budget, and say, but the first, I, I always like to, we like to, you know, take time to, to recognize what, what are we going to give this year, and that's a good thing to do. You know, the scriptures indicate that God enjoys, wants us to give with a, a willing heart, not out of compulsion or guilt, but willingly, and I see a pattern throughout the scriptures, how God, how, how God's work always requires people to give in order to see His plans accomplished on this earth. For example, David in the scriptures, King David, he knew that God had chosen his son Solomon to build a great temple. Uh, David's part was to lay out the plans and to provide the resources to get the job done. Gold, silver, bronze, precious stones. Uh, the budget for this magnificent edifice was, was huge, costly. Uh, so David, as the scripture says, he gave out of his private treasure. Uh, in other words, and in fact, the scripture says, I'll quote, it says, Moreover, because I delight in the house of my God, the personal treasure that I have of gold and silver, I give to the house of my God, in addition to all that I've already provided for the holy house. It's taken from 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 3. But really, it's the same today. If we value the free gift of salvation, we'll do everything we can to make sure this same salvation is made available to every nation, every tribe, every, every tongue on earth. Now, I've seen people uh, grow in the grace of giving, stepping out further each time to give God more than before. In fact, I think that's good to each year say, God, what, have we, what would you have me do? Can, I do? can I do more? You know, sometimes you might give and God will bless you and give you a pay raise. 
well, that's not the time to reduce the amount that you gave. God has blessed you. And while if maybe you say, well, I was, a, I was tithing, I was giving 10%, but now I got a pay raise. I'm making double what I used to make, and that 10% is just too big to give now. But recognize where did the increase come from? It came from God. Don't let that bigger amount scare you. Keep sowing the seed. Trust God. And keep stepping out further. That's called growing in the grace of giving. God will give you more. You'll give even more. Beautiful reality. And each time I've found that we discover God keeps increasing His blessing in our lives. A man named Wayne Myers, famous mission, missionary, did a great work for the Lord. He had a quote. He said, God can only trust you with money when material things become immaterial. In other words, God wants us to have money, but He doesn't want money to have us. But trust me, the scriptures are clear. Well, God can take the little and He can multiply it. When we give out of our hearts willingly and cheerfully, God delights. Yes, indeed, He delights to multiply. And I'm believing that for your life. This church will prosper, but as you prosper, the church is nothing more than people. It's not a brick building. It's not, it, we meet in a building, but a church, the church is you and I. And so this church, this church, will prosper, be able to do more for the kingdom of God as you and I, as we increase, as we multiply, as we prosper. And so we pray for you that you'll multiply, that you'll prosper, especially in this year ahead. We do believe that God has great things for this church family in 2022. Work around the world, work here in Toronto. Many lives are going to be transformed. Thank you for being a part of it by giving today. In a moment, in fact, I'll show right now the information how you can give. In a moment, I'll pray. But first, uh, for our Toronto family, you can see how you give e-transfer. How you can text your gift. You mail in your, your check to 190 Railside Road. Checks made out to TICC. You can phone in your gift. Or you can go to our website, TICC.ca. And for our worldwide audience, you can see information on the screen how you can give on PeterYoungbrin.org. Uh, you can take the, just take a picture of the screen there or, or, or how you can give by uh, wires. Back to our Toronto audience, and I'm just going to agree in, agree in prayer with you. This is the first Sunday of the new year, and I believe God's putting dreams, putting purposes for this year to prosper financially. Father, I thank you right now that you, you're the God of visions and dreams and creativity. You're God of increase, blessing, and prosperity. And I thank you that as individuals trust you right now with their finances, giving generously on this first Sunday of the year. Lord, I thank you that in the year ahead, Lord, I thank you for increase, blessing, and prosperity in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen come back to me now. Right now, this is what's happening. Megan has a powerful report. Don't, don't turn off the service. You got to see this. Then the Holy Communion. A lot of great things still upcoming. So first, let's go to Megan. Celebration Church, this past year, we have seen God do remarkable things in people's lives. Since reopening this past summer, after long lockdowns, we have seen over 60 people water baptized. One of those people baptized in water is a lady named Andy. Andy is now a regular here at Celebration Church and has a remarkable story of God setting her free from occultic practices. Here she is in her own words. Uh, I guess you could say pursuit of truth and maybe a tendency to, to make things more complicated than they are. Um, I felt that I really needed to um, to explore it. So I was fascinated by various religions that had a lot of devotion to prayer and the differences between how people express their faith in God. Um, so yeah, I, I, I ended up studying with a shaman for four years. Uh, that was about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, First Nations, tradition, spirituality. Um, and I, I just felt like I needed to to pursue it as far as I could, you mm -hmm. know? And where, how far did that take you? Well, I guess ultimately it's taken me here, mm. <laughs> um, which has been um, a very interesting journey. Mm. Uh, I just, I, I, through COVID, I was very isolated um, and, and things were pretty empty um, at the time, just before I found my way here. And from what I understand, you were even involved in, uh, I don't even know if I'm saying this word correctly, but tarot card reading. Oh, yes. Uh, also, uh, yeah, I had studied um, with other teachers and learned things like Reiki because my intention was really to be of service. And, um, and so I found all sorts of different ways that that might be possible. 
and um, and then counseling through through tarot cards and whatnot. Yes. And you had a whole business website yes. clients. Yeah, the whole thing. That's what I'd been kind of working on for the last year and a half through COVID. And Matthew said to me, you know, um, do you know God and 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 Jesus? And I and I said, actually, I really feel I've got a very strong relationship with God. And we had a really nice talk about it. And then he asked me if, if, if he could pray with me. And I said, absolutely. And so we started to pray together. And then he put his hand on my head. And after having experience with Reiki and whatnot and playing around with, with mm -hmm. energy, this was like something completely different. Um, and it, it felt like truth. It felt clear. Mm. And, um, and it overwhelmed me so much that I actually had to lie down. And Matthew stayed with me until, until I recovered. But the, also the things that he was saying while he was, you know, making sure that I was okay were things that he couldn't have possibly known mm. about me um, and, and what I was thinking and the thoughts that were going through my mind. So I knew that this was really powerful. And I kind of felt like you know, and I've said this several times with various people in the church, I felt that Matthew's encounter with me was, you know, Jesus course correcting mm. me and bringing me into a place where I would find the truth that, I am, mm. that I've been looking for. Mm. Amen. Since recording this interview, Andy has also brought her tarot cards and burned them in a time of worship with their young, uh, with our youth and young adults ministry. Celebration Church, this is just like the days of Acts, where it says in Acts 19:19 19, 19, that many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. Thank you, church family, for helping to make this happen. Your prayers, support, and love continue to build the community of Celebration Church, and we thank you for it. Well, we are going to partake in the Holy Communion, and I hope you have a cup ready, your uh, bread, and let's get ready to receive from the Lord. This is the first Sunday uh, of the new year, and as you project the new year ahead, maybe you see certain obstacles in your path. Could be. We all face obstacles. Jesus, in fact, said we would. Uh, you know, the Holy Communion, as it relates to our obstacles, is, 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 is important because it changes our perspective and the way we way we see those problems, those obstacles uh, uh, coming ahead of us. You know, uh, if you face an obstacle in the natural, uh, if you have the solution to that obstacle, the pro uh, or in other words, if you have the right tools to fix that problem, then you're not overwhelmed by it. For example, if you're you know, let's say you're on an off-road, uh, you know, with a lot of, you know, off-road, not paved, uh, one of those dirt roads with all kinds of rocks and bumps and roots and things. Well, you know, my wife and I, we have a ca Toyota Camry. Well, you know, if you're driving that off-road with a Toyota Camry, you know, you're going to be pretty, uh, I don't know what the word is, you're going to be all, you're going to be all nerve, you're going to be all stressed out because you're going to ruin that Toyota Camry, right? The Toyota Camry is not the right tool to navigate that, that rocky road. It's going to be ripped apart. But if you have a nice 4x4 Jeep, you know, my, 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 my wife and I met, she had a 4x4 Jeep. She still reminds me that she sold it before we got married. But anyhow, that's another story. If you have the right tool to navigate that dirt road, that off-road, eh, you're not nervous, you're not stressed out, you know. If you have that camera, you're all stressed out. But you got that Jeep, no stress. You see, in the same way, when we think of the obstacles in life, maybe you look thinking ahead to this new year, 2022, uh, and you see obstacles in the way. It could be, you know, financially, maybe in a relationship, I don't know, your body. You see an obstacle. It's so important to recognize that we have Jesus and all he means to us, all he represents, his power, his wisdom, his uh, you know, sanctification, his, uh, healing, favor. All of these are tools at our disposal. And when we recognize in Jesus freely by grace, and when we see that as a tool in our lives, we recognize I have the power, I have the strength, I have the wisdom, I have the ability to tackle, to overcome, to, to defy the odds, and to overcome those obstacles. Just like the Jeep on the, on the dirt road. You have the tools to be an overcomer. The scripture says, in fact, we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And so it's so important. That's why we take the time every service to receive the Lord's table, 
because it reminds us of the tool we have in Christ Jesus, the resources we have in Christ, healing and blessing and strength and power and, and might, wisdom, favor, sanctification. So I encourage you to look at the, the obstacles in the light of Jesus Christ as we partake right now. Let me just, first of all, ha lay hands on the elements. You do the same at home. I'll speak over them. But in obedience to Jesus Christ, who took the bread and wine and blessed it, I now declare that this bread and wine is sanctified for the purpose of the Lord's table in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Let's take the bread right now. Just like Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Partake and eat of it. Let's do the same right now. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for your body as being a tool of healing for our bodies today in the name of Jesus. Let's take the cup. Jesus said, this is the cup of the, my shed blood, the new covenant, forgiveness, righteousness. It's all ours in his, in him because of the blood. Let's partake right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. Just lift up your hands, put your cup down. Let's just pray together. Father, I thank you that on this first Sunday of the new year, I thank you that we can see the year ahead in the, in the perspective of Jesus, our Savior. We're in him, he's in us. And Lord, I thank you that we can, that we're more than conquerors in him. Lord, I thank you that we can look at the challenges that may be ahead of us, making decisions and uh, different financial challenges. Lord, I thank you that we have the tools to overcome, the tools to, to prosper, the tools to live a blessed life, the tools to, to, to make the right decisions, wisdom and strength. Father, I thank you that it's all ours in Christ. So I thank you that we can rest in you, knowing that you're with us, that you go ahead of us, that you prepare the way. Father, I thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. I know God's setting people free, giving hope to you today on this new year. And, and you know, God wants us to have a big vision, to not be overwhelmed by the circumstances and just to think me, my four no more. No, but to think outside the box, to think of others, to think of doing things for Him. That could be in your business, your family, it could be in ministry. But, but, but God wants us to have influence and to, to, to do great things for Him. The scripture says the people who know their God will do great exploits. God has great exploits for you this year. And we as a church family, we're partnered together as a church family. Together, move forward and do great things. We expect great things this year. Thank you for being a part of today's service. Megan has just something to share with you as well, so I'm going to pass it back to her. But to, back, back to her. But let me first say Happy New Year to you. You're blessed in Christ Jesus. Over to you, Megan. Thank you for being a part of our worship service today. Remember, if you are new to Celebration Church, we'd love to send you a free gift to say thank you. If you live in Toronto, we will mail you a free hardcover book written by Pastor Peter, The Faith That Works. Also, if you prayed to receive Jesus today, the next step in your faith journey is water baptism. We invite you to be water baptized at our next water baptism service, January 16th. You can go to TICC.ca to sign up today. Finally, if you need prayer, please email us at prayer at TICC.ca. <clears throat> Until we meet again, we love you, we're praying for you, and know God has good plans for you and your family this week. God bless and Happy New Year.